From the library of the New York Stock Exchange at the corner of Wall and Broad Streets in New York City, you're inside the Ice House, our podcast from Intercontinental Exchange on markets, leadership, and vision in global business. The dream drivers that have made the NYSE an indispensable institution of global growth for over 225 years. Each week, we feature stories of those who hatch plans, create jobs, and harness the engine of capitalism. Right here, right now, at the NYSE and at ISIS exchanges and clearinghouses around the world. And now, welcome, Inside the Ice House. Here's your host, Josh King of Intercontinental Exchange. I'm not going to lie. There's a certain wistfulness, a certain sense of loss when two storied names on the New York Stock Exchange merge their businesses, creating one powerful, enduring entity and the synergies that result. That's certainly progress, but it also means that one of those stock symbols disappear from our ticker. Such was the case in 2018 when CVS Health, that's NYSE ticker symbol CVS, completed its acquisition of Aetna. That was formerly NYSE ticker symbol AET. Both businesses got their start here as publicly traded companies going back almost a century. The Melville Shoe Corporation, which eventually became CVS after myriad mergers and divestitures, was listed on September 27, 1928. Aetna's shares listed here 40 years later, September 24, 1968. And when the two firms announced their deal in 2017, it was valued as a $70 billion merger. But that handshake and the ensuing press release was only the start of the process. One of the most important hurdles to bridge was antitrust approval from the Justice Department. After all, the Tunney Act, passed in 1974, requires the courts to ensure that such agreements are in the public interest. Judge Richard Leon of the United States District Court in Washington was initially skeptical of the deal. And he said, if the Tunney Act is to mean anything, he wrote, it surely must mean that no court should rubber stamp a consent decree approving the merger of one of the largest companies in the United States and the nation's third largest health insurance company simply because the government requests it, unquote. The backroom work of crossing the T's and dotting the I's on mega mergers are often a footnote to the glitz and glamour of the joint interview of CVS's chief Larry Merlo and Aetna's CEO Mark Bertolini when they meet on the set of CNBC at Post 9 on the NYC on the day of their formal handshake. Let's leave the details to the lawyers to work out is a paraphrase of the common refrain. Well, here on Inside the Ice House, footnotes are our stock in trade. We've never had the head of one of the world's leading law firms on our show, but as the healthcare landscape is changing beneath our feet, that overdue omission will finally be rectified. When the dust settled on the CVS Aetna combination, McDermott, Will, and Emery, one of several law firms working for Merlot and CVS Health Corp, revealed that it had advised on health regulatory issues as well as tax, real estate, IP, and IT, and also represented CVS on the sale of Aetna's standalone Medicare Part D prescription drug plans to a subsidiary of WellCare Health Plans Incorporated. These are the kinds of moves that ultimately convince a skeptic like Judge Leon to give his okay to the $70 billion deal. Those are the details that the lawyers work out. Today on the show, Ira Coleman, chairman of McDermott, Will & Emery, one of the largest law firms in the world. He joins us today to share his insight on the legal issues facing healthcare, the state of big law, and why lawyers who work for him can build their hours spent on wellness. Our conversation with Ira Coleman, right after this. Now a word from Jennifer Tejada, CEO of PagerDuty, NYSC ticker symbol PD. PagerDuty is a digital operations management platform leveraged by developers, customer support, IT, and security to help ensure that the brand experience for their end consumers runs perfectly all the time. Our organization reflects the diversity and the richness of our community. We're really excited about global impact. We chose the NYSE because it's a place where iconic companies are truly born in the company of giants. Our guest today, Ira Coleman, was elected the chairman of McDermott, Will & Emery in 2017, following nearly a quarter century with the firm. 
Previously, he led the corporate and transactional practice group and served as the managing partner for the firm's Miami office. Ira also serves as the general counsel for the Healthcare Private Equity Association, that's HCPEA, and presents regularly at private equity, national healthcare, and leadership-focused conferences on a variety of subjects. Ira, welcome to the New York Stock Exchange, and welcome inside the Ice House. Wow, thank you so much, and it's great being here, and that's uh, an introduction that I uh, have to make sure my mom listens to. (laughs) (laughs) That's wonderful, and you're too kind. Hopefully, I answer some questions and have a good time together here today, and share some insights into the business of law and and what we do and how we watch the uh, healthcare industry go from uh, a government, not-for-profit, church-owned, synagogue-owned business to uh, this incredible uh, for-profit powerhouse that it is today. Have you ever been to the New York Stock Exchange before? I think I came in fifth grade during uh, PS100 when we did our school trip, yes. And, And I think we rung a bell for uh, one of our clients, I got to have the privilege to do that. PS100, where was that? Uh, Brooklyn, New York, Coney Island. And that's where that's where the Colemans grew up? That's where the Colemans grew up. We moved to the country, which was Staten Island, New York, <laughs> over the Verrazano Bridge, and then uh, went to school in upstate New York at Albany, where I learned how to ski, uh, recognized how cold it was, and, and headed down to South Florida for law school, and enjoyed it down there. And as my wife likes to say, a Queens girl, I tricked her into staying instead of coming back. And we're going to get a lot into <laughs> the state of Florida and the state of healthcare. Uh-huh. Something you said struck me, though, church-owned, synagogue-owned industry. Your earliest memories and your sense of history of the healthcare industry from that nascent sort of community-created system that in which one person cared for another for a group of people. Sure. It well that's that's what it was. It was the Talmud like, New Testament like taking care of a neighbor of of uh, doing unto others like you would want done unto yourself. So when folks were sick, people had to take care of them. And it wasn't the big industry that it was today. So we had either the state doing it or the religious orders doing it. And nobody ever thought of it as a for-profit entity until probably in the late 80s, early 90s is when it really started catching on. We watched it, we helped it grow, and we helped build that trend. And when you go back, the earliest laws kind of on the books on this were the self-referral laws of 1986 around, uh, which which prohibited doctors and and those healthcare professionals from having an ownership interest in things that they sent patients to, you know, to kind of avoid that conflict of interest, which was very interesting because they wrote these rules after there was a whole big push to get doctors involved in the kind of uh, uh, the financing of the healthcare uh, industry. And what I mean by that, when new technology came out, like an MRI, there was no money to go out and buy it. And if this thing costs a million bucks, much easier to get 10 doctors together and each put up $100,000 and get this brand new MRI machine and, and bring new technology to the patients. And that was great. And they were encouraging that. And then all of a sudden, there was abuses there. And at one time, I remember Broward County, Florida, which is where Fort Lauderdale is, had more MRIs in just that little county than the entire country of Canada. They said, okay, something's wrong with this. We, we got to put out laws to prevent it. And they came out with these self-referral laws and, and something called the Stark Law, named after Congressman Pete Stark, that basically said, you shouldn't have an ownership interest in it. So they wrote the rules, and there was a lot of gamemanship around the rules. I would call it like the tax laws. There's certain things you can do, certain things you can't do, and you got to know where those lines are. Growing up in Coney Island, how did the Colemans go get their medical care? My parents were teachers, so we were part of the HIP plan, which was probably the first earliest kind of HMOs, where you went through a primary care gatekeeper, and then you went to a specialist if you needed it. So uh, we were very accustomed to that kind of gatekeeping model, uh, which is very different than the new generation of Coleman's, which were the worst consumers of healthcare. When we have a headache, we go to a neurologist. When we have a, a tummy ache, we're at a gastroenterologist. If my 
if my uh, foot's cramping, I'm an orthopedic surgeon in 10 minutes, right? High utilizes of expensive care, the worst way to do it, mm -hmm. rather than kind of rolling it back and, and, and trying to go talk to a primary care doctor first and maybe avoid the heavy, costly diagnostics. So from these early days back in Coney Island to this episode that I talked about in the introduction, your fingerprints, the firm, fingerprints of your firm are certainly on one of the most storied names of one of our listed companies, CVS Health, now with a market cap following the Aetna merger of $96 billion. Your memories of, of sort of the work on that deal? Sure. Some of our best and brightest were on it, kind of solving for really difficult issues to get clearance and go forward. Uh, Joan Polachek's one of my partners, one of the brightest people I know, she's a math major and, and clerked at the uh, Court of Appeals, uh, U.S. Court of Appeals. Brilliant mind, really helped work, work through that, and, and many of other partners. I mean, we had a team I mean, you've got a team that you've talked about, yeah. Kate McDonald, Jeremy Earle, yes. Ankur Gold, Timothy Schumann. I want to go into the lives of your partners, like like Joan, Kate, Jeremy, Anker, and Timothy, from the first call that they get from Larry Merlo or one of his lieutenants to that final deal dinner when all the documents have been signed and sealed. How does Joan and her team sort of engage from the beginning to end on something like that? Sure. Depending upon what the issues are in that particular one, we, we basically free up a kind of a tactical force dream team of, of experts in each of the verticals that we're covering. And then she's going to be the overarching quarterback of the team, so to speak, to make sure we're not missing anything. And I think, and this is goes, transcends one deal, but tells you something about the law these days, really good firms and really great firms in the future are going to be, are going to have to collaborate not only with your law firm, but many other law firms and other professionals as well. A lot of firms were on that deal, for sure. Yes. So I'm sure there are a lot of firms that we're working with on that deal and a lot of professionals like medical economists and antitrust experts and healthcare consultants and accountants, and the list goes on, investment bankers. So I think the people that win, the entities that win, are ones that can share their experience in a humble-like manner, bring that really relevant expertise and 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 really bring smartness to the table without being a smarty pants you know and 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 you also have to have a good way about you that people want to call you so i always say you know a good partner is one where when the phone rings and they say hey joan polichek's on the phone the ceo general counsel or somebody on the other side doesn't go like oh it's joan and make a grunt no they go oh it's joan i want to talk to her yeah you know that's the difference you could have the same knowledge base it's do you have the concern do you have the empathy and you have the humbleness that people want to work with you that's a big deal for us. i mean you have you mentioned and i couldn't miss it that there are a bunch of zeros on a deal like that and you're the chairman of a firm surpassing now a billion dollars in revenue how many toes do you, Ira Coleman, dip into the water on a deal like that, or do you let Joan do her work? Let Joan do her work. I'm only involved to, to say thank you to the general counsel or if there's something that's needed where they need the chairman of the firm to talk to somebody, whether it's at the government or the other side, happy to do it, You know, do that all the time. But uh, this is a crackerjack team, and I would probably be burning the eggs while they were making the great souffle. You are the number one healthcare law firm in the world, certainly beyond the borders of the United States. Much of the focus on data privacy stems from GDPR, or General Data Protection Regulations, something that many now that many that may not be covered now that uh, in Great Britain after Brexit. McDermott, Will and Emery released a special report on its potential impact. The full report can be found on your website. But as events play out, what's your opinion as of today of its impact? Yeah, I think that uh, GDPR is what's coming through the United States, maybe not today, but pretty soon. I think the EU is just more aware of it and more on top of it. And it took some time for us to kind of get there, and we're steeped in the rich tradition of uh, uh, free speech and stay away from anything that could thwart any kind of capitalism. So we always lean towards those freedoms, and we don't want to interfere with business, which is probably a good thing. But then you get 
these kind of breaches or or folks not knowing what's being done with their data and there has to be a balance so uh i think we're going to see more of that and and whenever you have these large industries that start getting heavily regulated it's it's very good for the law firms not just because hey we're going to make money but we can make a difference and it's very hard to engage young people these days so when people come into law and start working with us the the delayed gratification equation doesn't work anymore saying hey work really hard and stick with us and we'll pay you some nice money and then you'll get to be a partner and you're supposed to hear the organ music and a gold halo come over people and it doesn't resonate anymore so you got to do something else so the research shows us that engagement and doing things that are meaningful to people really make the job satisfaction a lot higher so we're blessed that we have a young cohort that that basically says our associates say that 87 percent of them will go above and beyond the call of duty for the firm or its client base that's like an astronomical amount. When you're in the 70s, people are writing stories about you in business school. So mm-hmm. we're, we're really lucky about that. When I go in and we ask some questions about it, it's because of the work we do. So when you can kind of put your fingerprint on what's going to happen to a GDPR-like law in the United States, trying to balance it, trying to have input on it, trying to explain it, trying to educate, trying to influence becomes meaningful and and when people talk about work-life balance we talk about work-life blend work-life balance makes it sound like okay when i'm at work it sucks okay and when i'm at home it's really fun so that's the balance no we want to say you should really enjoy your time at work you should feel like you're accomplishing things you should be able to go back home and share these stories that are entertaining that that uh brought you to a richer place. And if you could do that, then we're not talking about the late gratification of why you want to stick around. And we also recognize that many, like in the financial institutions, will have exits. They'll go someplace else. So they might start with us and then decide to do Teach for America or work on a startup or work for you know, one of the folks on your exchange. And then, and then maybe... Um, you know, drop back into the McDermott family. I heard a stat from Bain Consulting that said the folks who are entering the workforce now are going to live to over 100. So the rules that, you know, I came into the game with certainly don't apply. You know, it was you applied your trade, you retired, you lived a few years, you died. Now it's, you know, you're entering a, you could drop out of the workforce for 30 years have a have a brilliant career doing something else or or becoming just an amazing stand up paddleboarder and skier hmm. and and then drop back in you know you've traveled the world you've written books you've you've you know learned it at, at the feet of uh, do you encourage people to either take sabbaticals or go elsewhere for a while and do you are you do you actively welcome people back into the family we actively welcome people back in the family. We have many boomerangs, more during my tenure as, as chair than, than, than anything else. And it's one of the things I'm most proud of, that people feel welcome to come back. And we're really spending some resources to revitalize our alumni program, to make, have people know that we share that feeling and feel that connection. Um, do we encourage them to go out? A little bit, probably not as much as we should where where we do we do have coaching and we do have mindfulness and rest exercises that I think kind of stimulate those discussions of if I'm not happy how can I be happy what should I, what else should I be doing and we also bring in people from all walks of life to talk to people to talk to our folks about different things so we had uh, Stephanie Iser from uh, Girl and the Goat share some great things and great experiences and some really great personal stories when she was speaking to our women's summit up in chicago last year and and she was wonderful and she was really inspiring and would i be surprised that people said you know what i want to open a restaurant or i want to do this i think those are the kind of things that that uh that kind of get people thinking so uh 
maybe when we do our McDermott ski trip, when we have these great ski races coming down, people will say, oh, I missed my calling. I should have been a f- ski racer. And Frank Steiner will take a sabbatical. And, uh, or at least it be become GC for Vail Resorts, yeah, which exactly. I think would be a pretty good gig. <laughs> That's right. That's uh, got to be a great free ski pass on all the, their mountains, right? Uh, Going back to that CVS Aetna merger, it was first announced in late 2017. I want to hear a little bit from... CVS's chairman and CEO, Larry Merlot, when he announced the deal. Joining us right now is Larry Merlot. He is the president and CEO of CVS Health. And Mark Bertolini is the chairman and CEO of Aetna. And gentlemen, welcome to both of you. It's great to have you here today. Great to be here. This is uh, not exactly something that was a huge surprise or secret. We knew that it was behind (laughs) the scenes getting worked up. But why don't you two tell us how you came together and why? Why why this merger makes sense from your perspective? Well, you know what, Becky? We've had a business relationship going back to 2010. And... You know, as Mark and I continue to have discussions in terms of how can we do things more strategically, you know, it was clear as CVS Health was, you know, moving to become more of a healthcare company and getting closer to payers, Mark had a similar strategy in terms of getting closer to the customer. And it's really the perfect time to bring these two companies together to create a new healthcare platform that can be easier to use and less expensive for consumers and really create a new front door to healthcare in our country. I mean, that was such a big deal for everyone involved. As you scan the horizon for 2020, do you see things of that magnitude beginning to shape up? Sure. I think you're going to see some sizable transactions. And we always bucketed it into the kind of payer, provider, patient. And I think everything's kind of blending together a little bit. There isn't going to be any more pure payers, insurance companies. There aren't going to be any more pure providers, whether it be institutional or whether it be individuals. So we're seeing these kind of mega changes of, of people coming together and, and, and buying things, which, which, um, which creates some strange bedfellows. Folks who were traditionally competitive or at each other, significant stress in, in, in contracting and in litigation and stuff are now uh, going to be allies or actually owned by the same organization moving forward. I wouldn't be surprised if you see Big Four, Apple, Google, Amazon, Facebook, move into provider, payer status, things like that. It's just too big to ignore. Just tying it back up to this conversation we were having earlier about bringing younger associates up, educating them, getting them excited about the things that you guys are focused on, whether it's private equity, healthcare, restructuring. How do you ensure that your lawyers learn the industry-specific information they require to, to groom them on those first few years out of law school or when you bring them over laterally? Yeah, it's a great question because our clients, and we have client listening programs where we're out there talking to our clients all the time saying, what do you want? They say, I don't want to work with lawyers who don't know my industry and are asking you know, silly questions that we believe they should already know. So we do intense university-style training programs for folks who have self-selected dis- different disciplines and areas. So a vertical might be renewable energy. That's very hot these days, especially with young people coming out. I was schooled by one of my first-year lawyers because we had 14 single-use bottles in a room with eight people around the table. And I saw she was upset, and I'm like, what's the matter? And she said, look what's going on. And I'm like, but we cycle, we recycle them. She's like, that's not good enough. Renewable energy is one of our verticals, which, we, which we've been growing out, and people self-selected to that, and they want to learn everything about it. So we'll have classes on it. We'll have master's classes on it where senior folks in the firm will talk about their experience What's important to the industry? We'll have folks from the industry talking about it. In the private equity area, we do that. Plus, we do lunch and learns with private equity professionals who come in and talk to our folks. General counsel of HIG, one of the uh, larger private equity firms, came in and spoke to our entire corporate and healthcare group about how to get hired and fired uh, as a as a outside counsel to. Uh, to a private equity firm, and, and Rich Siegel's name is a wonderful guy, very honest and forthright, and talks about what he expects our youngest lawyers to know, and not on his dime. You know, if you want to work in the private in, private equity industry, 
here's the kind of things you should be reading, here's what you should be following, here's the type of understanding I want you to have. And, and then, uh, you know, most of our folks are pretty good self-start learners, so they're out there doing it, and they're doing it in ways, you know, when I met at an associate retreat and there's 500 McDermott associates there and I ask who listens to podcasts, pretty much every hand goes up. I do it to my partner's meetings. I'm probably at about a 50-50 shot. So there's different ways to learn. There's different ways to approach things. And uh, and I think that um, uh, if we drill down on technology, I always say to my young folks, you are so far ahead of any of the partners on this because you've been doing it your whole life. You've been working through it your whole life. You're so much more advanced. It's so much more natural to you. Use this as a springboard uh, to greatness, that you understand this, you work with it, you're comfortable with it. The people are, are younger, they're, they, they want diversity of thought. It's a, it's a great way to capture wonderful clients and, and, and have these very important discussions about their businesses. I mean, long before there was any such thing as a podcast, back when there was AM radio or Casey Kasem's American Top 40, how did Ira Coleman originally get interested in the law? Was it at SUNY Albany or sometime before? Well, I faked being a DJ. I was TJ the DJ on my, <laughs> on my cassette recorder, mixing in Billy Joel songs and Led Zeppelin songs and whatever was hot at the time, I guess, to, to hear my voice on the radio fakely of course but what got me into so so i always liked that aspect of it and i and i always love when you see there are these great finance professionals worth hundreds of millions of dollars and they love being djs my son's fraternity david solomon the chairman of goldman sachs being example number one exactly and and there's many of them many in the it's 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 incredible and impressive and i get it you know, it's fun to do. There's, there's in nothing. your neck of the woods at the Super Bowl a couple of weeks. Oh, yeah. he was he was a headliner. Oh, really? Yeah. He was. Ah, <laughs> that's wonderful. I missed his pool party. I would say that same thrill of of watching an audience react to you, picking a song or doing something. That's kind of what got me into law. Which was, you know, I my dad. Oh, he was an elementary school principal, and he always, you know, talked about wanting to be a lawyer. But his choice was to go uh, to college or be a painter because his my grandfather was a painter, and and my dad said he wanted to go to college to be a teacher because uh, the GI Bill would send him for free. So he did that, but he always talked about how if he could have done anything, he probably would have been a lawyer because he liked you know he liked that. So I gravitated towards it, and there were a few people in our neighborhood that were lawyers who would always talk to me about their cases when I hung out with their kids and went over there for dinner. So that kind of, I gravitated towards that. I would always talk to my dad about it. So when I was in college, my great summer job was a janitor in his elementary school. And I got to watch, this is my first lesson in leadership also, because I got to watch my dad as a principal be a true leader. I knew him as like kind of a strict parent and kind of a quiet guy and very honorable and and always doing the right thing and all of a sudden i'm watching i don't know if you had this in your schools but we always had these dance festivals and it was like you know the first week in in june and it was beautiful outside and everybody's outside and all the kids are happy to be outside and each grade had their own dance i think this was maybe it was the fifth graders or something they had like a 50s kind of twist and my dad jumped into the middle of the circle and did this crazy twist dance. Some of the teachers uh, that were there and grabbed some of the students in and was dancing it up with them. And I never seen my father do that. And I heard people talk about him in a very different way. You know, wonderful, charismatic guy he was and everything. And I'm like, boy, that's very different than I know him as a son. And it was wonderful to see and explore and the respect that he had Mm. from always kind of doing the right thing, being fair and 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 being humble and never putting himself above the teachers, above the students or above the families that came in. And it, it was pretty amazing because 
New York City school system, you don't have a lot of funds to do things. You have very little power to get rid of underperforming teachers. Mm -hmm. You know, they're pretty protected by the union. Yep. And he was able to always have his school in the highest rankings and, and this wonderfully engaged PTA, wonderfully engaged faculty, you know, and I would always say, well, wow, that's a miracle that he could do it. And remember, I'm a 18 year old kid in college. I don't really care about these things. So it really must have been pretty special that it, that it made a memory, it made a stamp with me. And I also remember when I would work in the school and you're a janitor, you know, I'm the guy with the keys and the, the overalls. Yep. And, and, and all the people were leaving to go to work in the city at these big jobs. And some people would look right through you, even if you said good morning to them, they wouldn't even answer. I'm sweeping the schoolyard from a wild weekend of broken bottles and fires. I don't know why kids like to start fires, but that's what they did. Some people would be so nice to me and would give me a big smile and a big good morning on the way into work, and some people would ignore me. And and I always it always stuck with me that nowhere, no matter where I was in life, I want to be the person that says hello to everybody and treats everybody equally, because I don't want to. I don't want to feel like I don't want to leave somebody feeling like they left me feeling. And even though I could rationalize and say, well, this is not my station in life. I'm going to. I'm in college now. I'm going somewhere. I'm going to go to law school. I'm going to do all these things. But at that particular moment, when they, when you have that feeling, you, you, you feel empty. You feel like you're invisible. So I don't ever want people in my firm to treat people like they feel invisible, and I don't ever want to, mm. people to feel like they're in my firm and I treat them invisible. That's so interesting. I mean, talking about first lessons in leadership, I, I gather, Ira, based on your resume, that you and I are roughly the same age. So I'm much older than I, you. I assume <laughs> that, that you, like me, might have consumed an episode or two of L.A. Law mm -hmm. in your youth. So let's take a little sidebar into the partners meeting of Mackenzie, Brackman, Cheney, and Cusack. I want to get <laughs> one chairman's view of how he conducts a partners me meeting and contrast it to yours. A new matter. Leon Croner, a medical corporation, versus Celia Robinson. A doctor is suing our client for a $750 bill. A collection matter? It's a little more complicated than that. For the last nine months, her insurance company's been giving her the runaround, and that's why the bill's not paid. Miss Perkins, undoubtedly you've seen those ads on television. Lawyers in polyester suits soliciting for clients. Yes, sir. Those lawyers handle $750 collection cases. Mackenzie Brackman Cheney et al. does not handle $750 collection cases. Douglas, will you come off it? This is a referral from Morley Saperstein. I ask Abby to help me with it. As your time is usually billed at $135 an hour, Miss Kelsey, how much exactly did you intend to charge this client for whatever heroics you might perform on this $750 matter? What I intend is to charge her nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so how closely does Ira Coleman's style chairing a meeting of the partners of McDermott, Will and Emery approximate Douglas Brackman, played by the great Alan Rachins, grilling Jill Eikenberry as Ann Kelsey? I wish I could say I had that kind of discipline around our partners. I think I'm much more of a, of a uh, servant leader, kind of a little bit of a uh, sherper of the flock to, to, to really uh, help people, really smart people, achieve what they otherwise couldn't achieve by themselves, mostly through encouragement and, and showing them that they could do this. It really is my honor to, to be the chair of this firm. It's got an 85-year amazing history, you know, gone through just incredible times, incredible smart people there, just a, a wonderful collection of partners, associates, and staff professionals. So I would say, yes, do we, we, we are very data-driven, evidence-based, so I think he'd be proud of me for that. But I think we are much more of a, we want to be servant leaders and help you get to where you could go, help you just do things that much better. Our unofficial motto is hashtag always better. And that comes from, you know, we can always do a little bit more, a little bit better, 
our clients are paying us more each year, our rates go up. We, we have to offer something more. We have to get smarter. We have to get more efficient. We have to use artificial intelligence. We have to ask the right questions. We have to learn the businesses better. We have to hire better. All those things, each and every year, I think we have to go back and do it. But L.A. Law was one of the sexiest shows on TV. Who didn't want to be a lawyer after that? I mean, when you say whether you're Jill Eikenberry or Susan Day watching L.A. Law or you're in the present day at McDermott, Will and & Emery and you are adhering to this philosophy of always better, you've got to get really great people under your roof and your thousand plus lawyers. And the legal field, possibly more than any other profession, puts this premium on educational background. I mean, in fact, when former Associate Justice of the Supreme Court Antonin Scalia was asked what it would take to succeed as a lawyer by a George Washington University law student, he had no issue saying this. I'm going to be picking, you know, for Supreme Court law clerks. I can't afford a miss. I just can't. So I'm going to be picking from the, the law schools that, uh, that basically uh, are the hardest to get into. They admit the best and the brightest, and they may not teach very well, but you can't make... You, you, you can't make a, a, a sow's ear out of a silk purse. And if, if they come in the best and the brightest, they're probably going to leave the best and the brightest, okay? Uh, now, I started, the reason I tell the story is one of my former clerks, who I am the most proud of. I mean, that story was picked up by Malcolm Gladwell as part of his exploration of higher education in the last season of Revisionist History. Do you feel that not having one of the marquee names in your degree affected your opportunity coming from Nova in Miami? I think you got to work that much harder. And, and I, I, I love Gladwell's podcast. I thought that was great. And I liked him taking the LSAT. I thought that was pretty great, too. The two areas, um, and this is, I, I, I agree with Scott Galloway, the two areas in the U.S. that are ripe for disruption are, are health care. Okay, and higher education, because higher education has become kind of an elitist luxury brand, and and uh, healthcare for all the reasons that we talked about and more. So so I do think there's pressure on the mediocre that it's terrible coming out of. I've lost clients or haven't gotten clients because I didn't go to Harvard or didn't have that pedigree. But I could tell you that when I'm in a room full of our lawyers, where a bunch of people on my team did go to Harvard and Princeton and all the great schools, um, you know, the, there's you either get it or you don't get it. And attitude has a lot to do with it, and hardworking has a lot to do with it. And I'll point to the, the Malcolm Gladwell book, I guess it was Outliers, where he talks about smart enough, you know, where if you, 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 you take a mix of really smart people and if you if you rank them by IQ and you thought the top IQ people were going to do the best and the middle would do the middle and the lowest would do the lowest and it didn't turn out that way. It's which ones had the family support, which ones had the hustle, which ones, you know, had other things. That's the way it is in law. S smartness, as wonderful Judge uh, Justice Scalia said, really, you know, is, is a good baseline and, and in in what they do and in being very careful and in, in, in really carefully chosen words, it probably means even more. But in, in the day-to-day, -day, and this was from one of my clients who's a woman who went to Columbia Law School and Princeton undergrad, she said, Ira, I'd rather work with a lawyer who knows how to get me a good answer fast than the best answer in a very ineffective way, inefficient way. And, and that resonated, like just know when you're done with this and what the problem takes and then move, and then move forward. So as the managing partner on uh, LA Law was correctly pointing out, what are you gonna do for that $700 case? How are you gonna make, how are you gonna bring efficiency to it? He knew intuitively that they weren't going to, that you were doing this pro bono, that you were doing this for free, you were doing this for ulterior motives, which might be great, you know, but that's, you have to always have the eye towards how would you solve it in a business-like manner? So I think it's unfortunate that mediocre doesn't get the chance anymore and, and elitism is there. Those are the kids that we go after. That's the kids that we go. But we're really trying to do something different and we're trying to really put some data around it because if you look at who succeeds at our firm, it's not just that. 
And it's some of the people who kind of snuck in through the back door and blow people's doors off be our most produ- become our most productive and vibrant partners. I mean, our mutual friend is a guy who just got a job pulling cables from one floor of a law firm to another, and he did not have one of those uh, elite law degrees. He went and got some arcane reading law some in Europe or something, but the guy's a hard worker. That's amazing, and a really bright fellow. Getting a good answer and moving forward. After the break, Ira Coleman, the chairman of McDermott, Will and Emery, and I discuss some of the recent acquisitions that he's made for the firm and his outlook for the firm. That's right after this. And now a word from Teladoc, NYSE ticker T-D-O-C. When I get sick, I'm too busy to reschedule my day. And that's why I use Teladoc. I don't need to wait. I can talk with a U.S. board-certified doctor by phone or video within minutes who can diagnose, treat, and prescribe medication for conditions like the flu, bronchitis, allergies, and more. For me, my family, even my coworkers, 24-7, anywhere, anytime. They've already connected over 4 million patients to get the care they need. So what are you waiting for? Visit teledoc.com. Welcome back. Before the break, Ira Coleman, chairman of McDermott, Will & Emery, and I were discussing how his career progressed leading up to being named chairman of the firm in 2017. Ira, what inspires a person to go from a very successful practice, you've built out your team, you know exactly what you're doing, to telling your partners that you want their vote to be elected chairman? It was interesting because I had a great life and things were going well. My clients and I were really working hand in hand and we had great teams. So I didn't really have to do much to just kind of continue on this wonderful glide path. And some days I look back and go, why? But I never hesitated because it was a calling that I had because of a man named Larry Gerber, who when I joined the firm, he was the chair. And Larry took the firm from this sleepy Chicago firm, probably making under $200,000 profits per partner, all the way up to the big leagues where we were competing with the largest New York firms, and I think we were 16 or 17 in profits per partner and 16 or 17 in in, uh, our economics of overall economics. So it was very easy for me to say, hey, I want to get us back to where our rightful place in the AM law, that's the American lawyer top 25, it's this craziness that private companies report their results to a magazine, but that's what we do in law. I don't know. One day we'll come back and (laughs) figure out why we do it, and we continue to do it. We would say it doesn't matter, and it's not the measure, but it's one of the measures, and uh, it, it also helps with our virtuous cycle. We're able to acquire great talent, and if you have great talent, you can do great work, and if you do great work, you get you get great results, and then and then clients come to you because you have great results. And if you're getting great results and you have great clients, then you have the best work. If you have the best work, you get the best people, and it creates this wonderful virtuous cycle. So I said, I've seen us go from the highest highs, and then we got a period of where I'll call it a little uh, fat and lazy, you know, maybe a little too happy, drinking our own Kool-Aid a little too much. And it was very easy to make softer decisions rather than the hard decisions that got us to where we were. So we we backed off. And and why do you think that was? um, I think because the recession came through and we made we made the bets that any revenue was good revenue instead of really trying to kind of signal out what was really in the best interest of the clients, what was really in the best interest of training our young people and 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 being able to move forward that way so we we took our eye off the ball a little bit so everybody got scared because the you know the world was over in 2008 2009 right so so other firms kind of came back a little stronger a little faster and we did it so that hurts and once you're you 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 get that hit it's hard to kind of uh, turbocharge yourself back and I think uh, that our leadership then, while they, while they did the best they could and they were doing a wonderful job of, of really uh, kind of right, riding the ship, we didn't move fast and as definitively as we could. And we saw this, you know, some of us saw this. And I said, if I'm going to do this, I was very maybe brutally honest. You know, we had a lack of investment in certain uh, CapEx that we wanted to make in technology and in uh in offices and things like that. And it was gonna to be to the tune of 25 to $30 million right out of the partner's pocket. So 
not the greatest platform to run on, but truthful. And then and then also truthful of saying, hey, you know, you know, if you want to take this journey with me, elect me, which is very different than how we're going. If you want to do that, great. If you don't want to do that, that's fine. And, you know, I'm here. I'm McDermott for life. Love this place. It's great. And that's fine. And we went forward. I got elected. I was really excited about it. And I flew without a net on my first. Was it a squeaker? How Did you have old guard who wanted to? Keep things the way they were? It's kind of like electing the Pope. It's our, our management committee, our board of directors, our 21 voting members actually make the decision. So it's secret ballots yeah. and nobody really knows. So so I always like to tell uh, my children that I was elected by unanimous decision, right? <laughs> but no, I'm sure it was a squeaker. There were many of us running and we, we went through the process. And what's really nice is several of the folks who were running came up to me and said, so glad you won. You have taken the firm in directions that I could never have. You did such a better job than I would have, and I'm thrilled that it worked out this way. So that's the kind of partnership we are, and and there are still people I turn to all the time for great advice um, inside and outside the firm. But I think that uh, going back to the, the why, it was really easy for me to say I had a clear vision of where we needed to be, that I needed to have great people around me to help do that, and then, and then I needed the whole partnership to be behind us and executing on it. So when I'm telling people they're taking a 5 to 10% compensation hit just to get us kind of back to where we needed to be so we can get our conflict system, you know, well, uh, well-oiled, our client intake well-oiled, our, our technology platform up to snuff, all of that stuff. And that's what we did uh, in 2007, and we were able to deliver – that investment back within that year, which was pretty amazing. So then I think I got some credibility with the partners. And then when in 2018, and we went out and did our biggest acquisition ever, I was able to look them in the eye and say, hey, I feel good about this. And I want you to trust me on this. You know, collectively, they did. And and we went forward and, and we had uh, we had outsized results from from that great acquisition in 2018. And then instead of sitting back on our heels in 2019, we we doubled down again and added another 50 plus partners uh, laterals to grow and develop. And all at the same time, growing our internal resources and growing our client base and adding some really nice clients and some really um, valuable nuanced practices to help build out uh, the power alley practices that we have. The power alley practices of tax, private client, healthcare. You decide to make this move to hire this large group from DLA Piper. How does it actually, I mean, we, we, we talk so much in this room in the library about M&A between big companies. How does M&A work between big law firms? M&A between big law firms is so personal and so individual that you'd be wildly surprised of what could queer a deal and and how it really is about personal touch and feel and culture and not the not cultural veneer of hey you know we all have beautiful offices and shiny cups on our desk but but real culture of 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 helping people out of 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 going to bat for each other and things like that and, and, and just doing everything you can for a client. So we look at it as our first thing is indispensability, right? Um, our, uh, is this move, is this lateral move going to make us more indispensable to the, our clients? Second thing, is it going to make us more productive, more profitable? And the reason why we need that is to continue to add to our luster, to add to our brand, to do the things that we need to do so that people know who we are and the quality that we deliver. And then the last one, and this is the goofy one, is is this going to make the place a more fun, a happier place? And and I'll talk to laterals and they'll look at me like I have three heads when I go, these cultural things matter to me. So I make people pull out their uh, telephone and I say, what's your Uber rating? And... Um, if somebody's under a, and I'm not, I'm not allowed to give that standard anymore because <laughs> I, I uh, but, but you, you could pick a number and you kind of say something wow. better than Travis Kal- Kalanick's Uber rating. <laughs> so you want, you want, uh, you want them to, you want them to feel that they treat people well, 
you know, you feel really good when you're talking to somebody who pulls out their 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 well used uh, Uber rating and it's a you know a four nine five and you go this this person's doing something right to the little guys and that makes us feel good. So so when you do these acquisitions, they are major. They can kind of break the spirit of the firm uh, if you're not careful and you have to manage the culture on both sides because the people coming in yeah, is, the laterals are used to dla yeah. piper's culture and they've got to get used to the happiness factor of vira coleman how does that work it gets annoying very quickly but but i would say what you want to give them is you want to give them access and and you want to give them introductions and you want to give them portfolio to get things done but you also have to manage the culture of your own firm where you don't want, you know, you know, the, the, the new kids should get all the cookies and, and the, you know, the new kids should always get all the shiny toys. And, and you want people to feel like there's a fairness to it. You know, I always say we want to treat people fair. That doesn't mean equal necessarily, but it means fair. And, you know, who's really good at this. Marty Lipton at Wachtell. Like when, whenever I talk to Marty, I learn something about managing people and relationships and the like. And he's just kind of, you know, a very humble guy who doesn't have to be. And, and talk about a guy who's done all kinds of M&A on the biggest stage, you know, and he's friendly and, and giving and, and spends time with me. And it's, it's just a wonderful statement of, of the kind of, uh, uh, character that 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 led the most successful uh, legal institution of our times. So you're talking about ideas like the indispensability of your firm to your clients. You're talking about doing something right for the little guys. You're talking about asking someone for their phone and checking out what their Uber rating might be. So from the lows of the lows after the financial crisis, when McDermott might have rested on its laurels and got a little lazy, you've used a, a, a number, maybe I'm misremembering it, of $200,000 profit per partner. The last number I'm looking at on one of your reports is 2017, $1.7 million in profits per partner. Where are you today and what does that say? We crossed the line of $2 million profits per partner this year, which is really exciting this last year, 2019 which is really exciting, but it's, it's, it's not the profits because it means our partners make more money. It's, it's the ability to invest in the things that we need to invest in to really service the clients and, and hire the talent. So I mean, everybody says, oh, well, legal salaries are through the roof and these kids are making a fortune. Yes, that's true, but go look at the tech companies, go look at the financial institutions, go look at you know, the investment banks. All these kids are making more money, and they didn't go necessarily to graduate school. So we're competing for talent with those folks as well. And I think when you look at it in lifestyle, in in um, in stress, in in all that stuff, we're right up there. So our young folks are really, you know, they're earning it. Nobody's giving it to them, and our clients are being rightfully demanding of the best and brightest from day one. And uh, it's, a, it's, it's heavy competition, and we want to be transformational in what we do and being able to say to our clients, how do you want to be priced? How do you want to be serviced? How do you want to do things in the future? Are you comfortable with us using AI? Are you comfortable with us using outsourced services? You know, we want to get there and make you comfortable with it. We're not here to say we will do everything except compromise our margin. You know, that's not that's not a good partner. What we want to be able to do is be successful. And, it, and if we're successful in the manner in which makes you successful, we're worth every penny we get paid worth every penny you get paid. McDermott, Will & Emery is one of a few select law firms that is Mansfield 2.0 certified. How does a firm become certified and what are some of the policies that you put in place to be recognized for your commitment to diversity? Diversity and inclusion is one of my big initiatives. It's been on the firm's mind for a while, but we're, you know, we try to be now very 
data-driven evidence base in our decisions. So Mansfield 2.0 really helps us with that. It requires us, when we're considering laterals, to consider a certain amount of laterals of color and diversity. When we're interviewing for leadership positions, we have to interview certain threshold amounts and clear those diversity thresholds. And more than just interviewing, we're placing people in these positions. We are, they've earned it, but we're recognizing them. And we're also really pushing leadership rotations to get more young and diverse people into leadership positions earlier than ever. So Mansfield 2.0 is a great wake-up call to law firms to help push us to do what we should be doing. Uh, just like the Rooney Rule in the NFL, hopefully we'll see some changes and we'll really push it forward. We know that diversity helps make better decisions, which is better for clients. So not easier, but better. I mean, Mansfield 2.0 exists. The Rooney Rule exists. A lot of critics of the NFL would say that despite the existence of the Rooney Rule, it hasn't been all that successful. I mean, back when Stephen Boschko was writing his 172 episodes of L.A. Law, he created these great parts for Susan Day as Grace Van Owen and Jimmy Smits as Victor Sanfuentes. But that was fiction, Ira. I mean, what's happening in, in the entire industry of law about the state of diversity across the profession, and is it happening fast enough? No, it's not happening fast enough. And uh, Tony Upshaw, my good friend and partner in charge of diversity at our firm, has put an edict out. He serves on our management committee, which is our board of directors. And Tony put an edict out when we were at MIT. We did a management committee meeting at MIT CSAIL, which is the Computer Science Artificial Intelligent Lab. And, and when you spend time with those folks, you feel really dumb very quickly. And Tony put out there that we should strive to be the most diverse AMLO 100 firm there is. And so we're, we're using that as our benchmark. We're not using the fact that maybe we're 50% better in diverse equity partners. Okay, great. We're 3% and others are 2%. That's not the measure. The measure should be when, when, when we get to kind of matching what society is. And, and it's not just on the hires. I mean, we do a really good job on the early ones in. Where we, where we miss out is, is why are they leaving the system earlier than others? And, and how can we get them back? And how can we not only mentor them, but sponsor folks uh, in this position? I wouldn't be where I, where I am if I wasn't sponsored. And while I'm not a diverse kid, other than I had no, uh, I had no connection to Miami. My parents were from Brooklyn, New York. I went down there to go to school and stayed. So I really had no network, and others took me under their wing and and helped make me. And I'll never forget that. And I want us to always do that for others. And I think especially diverse folks coming into a law firm where even though it feels comfortable for us, it's got to feel really uncomfortable uh, for some of them. So we got to make a difference and do the right outreach and not only do it statistically, but do it emotionally. You're talking about doing it emotionally. You've said that the most important trait for a law firm partner is love and compassion. Last year, there were a number of high profile protests at technology companies over the decisions that companies made to work on projects. But there was recently a boycott of a major firm by Yale students who were unhappy with their client list. And what agency should new or potential lawyers have in deciding what clients to work on? You know, I think it's hard because I go back to, look, everybody's entitled to a defense. I'd be careful going down that slippery slope. Can law firms do better? Can we do better? Yes. But I think it's, it's quick to get ruthless, and that's why I say look at it from a point of view if you can have some love and compassion and bring that to the job and bring that to leadership, you probably do a little bit better. you got to balance that because we also play uh, at my firm in the Ray Dalio approach of radical transparency, radical honesty, and, and a meritocracy of ideas. So it doesn't feel like a lot of love and compassion when you're pointing out some failings. But but if you do it in a way that you show people that you care when just trying to make everybody better, I think you're okay. As far as, you know, taking clients, we, 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 we try to be pretty straight down the middle there. Do things just to make money if it's uh, 
completely repugnant. It's going to be very hard to get acceptance on it. But we also recognize that everybody's entitled to a defense. And, and even if that doesn't feel great while you're doing it, that's part of what makes uh, uh, America the greatest country on earth and why what makes uh, the American judicial system one of the greatest on earth. We've talked about all these things that have happened to McDermott since the financial crisis, since your ascension to its chairmanship, and all the metrics that you look at that give you a precise view of where you are now. But you got to go home back to Miami and think about where is my firm going from here. So both geographically and in your core practices, where do you see some of the most unrealized growth that you want to capitalize on? Well, I, I, you know, I think the way, um, you know, the, the, the way we have plotted out healthcare and touching kind of all facets of that industry, we have to continue our ascension in that area. You can't rest on your laurels. So that's one. It's a, it's a tremendously fascinating, highly regulated, constantly changing industry. So you, you have to stay up on it and be expertise on it all the time which means adding skill sets, hiring people from the government, hiring people from uh, education, hiring the, the, the best and brightest. And, I, and, and we also, our power alley of trust and estates is the normal words, but we, we, we call it private client where we represent 26 of the 50th wealthiest families around the world and probably acquiring more. These days, they, they operate like businesses and you have to treat them very differently than businesses, but you also have to recognize the financial impact that they have. And then I would say service delivery models. Every, the big four are pushing into our business. The big four accounting firms are pushing into our big business. The big four technology firms can very well push into our business, the Google, Amazons, Apples, and Facebook. So, so you're not, even though it's a wonderful business, it's an amazing profession, um, you're not immune from that. There are already laws out there uh, in several states that are saying you can have non-lawyer partners as owners. So, so we're seeing that the guild kind of go away, and 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 I hope the apprenticeship model doesn't go away because it's a great way to learn, and 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 uh, I would hate to see that go away. But I think being very savvy in technology-wise, being able to 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 represent companies, especially in the technology space meet them where they are, uh, service them in different ways. I think we're going to change from having all the answers to the best lawyers are gonna ask the right questions. And why we have to ask the right questions because you know, machine learning and AI are gonna be able to produce answers for us. So we're gonna to have to frame the questions in such a way that, that they get us to the right answers. So I think that's an important thing, and I think developing these knowledge strategies around that and being able to, to, to really work with what clients need are going to be uh, what, what's a key for the future. We started our conversation at Coney Island, watching your dad, the public school principal, dancing in the middle of his, of his uh, peers and his teachers and his students. We've come down to Miami. We've we're now in one of the biggest law firms in the world, uh, talking about McDermott, Will, and Emery. Is the legal profession one that you hope that your kids, Zach and Alex, pursue and thrive in? Alex is a, a lawyer, uh, so she she's doing it. And my son's uh, uh, in the uh, private equity world up here in New York. And my wife's a recovering lawyer. So uh, we have very interesting uh, conversations at the dinner table, and some of them are uh, Supreme Court and uh, stuff, and some of them are the Kardashian family kind of stuff. <laughs> I mean, whether this comes from the Coleman table or just in your reading and talking with, with your colleagues and partners, what do you think of the, is the biggest issue facing the legal profession in 2020 and beyond? You know, I, I, I really think that you got to take care of people. And that take care of people is both physically and mentally. People talk of the war for talent. We talk about it as the love of talent. So I think folks like uh, Alex Yang, who talks about rest and recovery. I think if you hear LeBron James has got uh, an active routine about getting hours of sleep and getting some naps in. Navel Ravikant talks about performing like an elite athlete, work like a lion. 
you know, work really hard, then rest a lot, then repeat that, train for it, repeat that. I think that that we're seeing folks really that's catching on in a big way and it's allowing teams to outperform other teams. So getting measurements around that and showing clients that I think is a is a pretty neat thing and I think 2020 is going to deliver on on quite a bit of that. Taking care of people and the love of talent. Thanks so much, Ira, for joining us inside the Ice House. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. This was great. That's our conversation for this week. Our guest was Ira Coleman, chairman of McDermott, Will, and Emery. If you like what you heard, please rate us on iTunes so other folks know where to find us. And if you've got a comment or a question you'd like one of our experts to tackle on a future show, email us at icehouse at theice.com or tweet at us at Icehouse Podcast. Our show is produced by Pete Ash with production assistance from Ken Abel and Stephen Romanchik. I'm Josh King, your host, signing off from the Library of the New York Stock Exchange. Thanks for listening. Talk to you next week. Information contained in this podcast was obtained in part from publicly available sources and not independently verified. Neither ICE nor its affiliates make any representations or warranties, express or implied, as to the accuracy or completeness of the information and do not sponsor, approve, or endorse any of the content herein, all of which is presented solely for informational and educational purposes. Nothing herein constitutes an offer to sell, a solicitation of an offer to buy any security, or a recommendation of any security or trading practice. Some portions of the preceding conversation may have been edited for the purpose of length or clarity. 